It was 7 a.m. on a gloomy Wednesday morning. I just got off bus number four at the university station. Walking towards the library building, I spotted something red moving in a cold air. As I paced closer to the tree covered walkway, more red dresses appeared before me. I froze to the blood curling image and chilling atmosphere. To say I felt the goosebumps overtaking my whole body is an understatement. As a family member of a sister who suffered from gender based violence and now living with schizophrenia, for a while I thought, darn, am I imagining things? Am I alright? What are this? I was immovable for minutes. It was only when my tears dropped at the back of my hand holding to the strap of my crossbody bag that I regained my composure and brought myself back to the reality that what I was seeing was real. These red dresses were real. I found myself next sitting on a bench and a millennial that I am, the impulse was to Google Yes, to search the internet, why are there red dresses hanging around campus? That day turned out to be May 5th, which is Red Dress Day across Canada and USA. A day to commemorate as well as to raise awareness about missing and murdered Indigenous women and relatives, or MMIWR. Missing and murdered Indigenous women and relatives, or MMIWR, refers to indigenous women, men, children, and all our relatives who are impacted by the high statistical rates of targeted violence. It is also a movement that advocates for the end of violence and injustices against native peoples, indigenous peoples, and draws awareness to the high rates of disappearances and murders that they experience, particularly in the US of A and Canada. Some other terms uh, for the movement include MMIWG or Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, MMIW Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, MMIP Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples, and recently uh, the more inclusive um, terms that have been used are MMIWG2S or Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two Spirits People and MMIWR or Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives. So these two uh, terms have been um, noted to be more inclusive, uh, noting that uh, the violence that affect Indigenous uh, peoples across Canada, United States and beyond um, affect not only women and girls, but as well as men and other peoples of uh, diverse gender orientation. MMIWR actually began in 2011 when red dresses were used as symbol for the tragic disappearances and deaths of indigenous women uh, through the red dress project by Winnipeg based artist um, Jamie Black who is a Métis. Why should we care about the missing and murdered epidemic? I will pause for a minute or some minutes to give us time to read snippets of two MMIWR stories in this slide. According to the Federal Bureau of Investigation's National Crime Information Center 2020 report, there were 5,295 indigenous women and 4,276 Indigenous men reported missing across the United States. This data does not include the cases that have yet to be entered in the crime database. The Center for Disease and Control and Prevention also suggests that Indigenous women and girls face physical and sexual violence at greater rates than women from all other racial and ethnic groups across U.S. Indigenous women are murdered at 10 times the rate of other ethnicities. Murder is in fact the third leading cause of death for indigenous women in America. While these numbers suggest a staggering cases of individuals victimized by MMIWR, 
and thousands of families affected by this epidemic. To date, only about 200 cases are officially lodged with the Department of Justice. In Canada, Indigenous people collectively make about 4.9% of the total population, according to the 2016 census. However, Indigenous peoples are far more likely than other Canadians to become victims of killings. Statistics Canada say that in 2020, the rate of homicide for Indigenous peoples was seven times higher than for non-Indigenous peoples. A recent report by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police or RCMP in 2021 also indicate that 1,017 women and girls identified as Indigenous disappeared and or were murdered between 1980 and 2012. This is a homicide rate roughly 4.5 times higher than that of all other women in the country. The Native Women's Association of Canada, however, said that these numbers is an underestimation in that actually nearer to 4,000 Indigenous women and girls have been missing or murdered in the past three decades. Indigenous or Aboriginal men also account for approximately 71% of homicide victims in Canada, but the rates of violence against Indigenous men don't seem to mobilize the same kinds of support or interest, either by the state or popular media, and haven't been studied to the same extent. This was according to Dr. Adam Jones, a professor of political science at UBC Okanagan. Clearly, from these posted statements and enumerated numbers, we know that too many families and communities have been hurt by not knowing what happens to their sisters, mothers, aunties, uncles, brothers, and other people whom they know and love. People disappear in ways that leave their communities grappling with the unknown. Some people went missing for years without their families even knowing how to look for them. And when people are found, most of their loved ones experience the heartbreaking pain that comes with knowing that they lost a relative in a violent way. Indigenous families are left to fight for justice against systems that are often ill-prepared to handle cases like what they experience or systems that deprioritize and under-investigate cases of missing and murdered indigenous peoples and relatives. MMIWR is a form of systemic racism and injustice. Systemic racism and injustice has a deep historical roots, especially in colonial states of North America. Broadly speaking, systemic racism and injustice is defined as the deeply ingrained racist thinking, practices, and action that lead to the marginalization and oppression of minoritized groups. These include indigenous peoples, women, and people of color. Different studies now suggest that MMIWR is rooted in two specific causes. Number one, the colonial thinking that indigenous lives matter less than non-indigenous peoples. And two, the heteronormative thinking that women and people who are non-binary or people who do not conform to the cis or straight men-women constructed categories are considered secondary citizen and have lesser rights. Issues around MMIWR is also compounded by other issues. These include the underreporting of cases in different state agencies, the lack of efforts to create gender and indigeneity aggregated data, making Indigenous uh, communities, families, and Indigenous rights advocate question, how does the state exactly know how many Indigenous women, uh, girls, and relatives are missing if we do not uh, keep track and know victims' identities? Indigenous tribes, bands, and communities have also been uh, documented reporting 
different barriers in accessing resources and services. These include the lack of uh, state support, negligence of the state, the lack of cultural sensitivity among service providers, the pervasiveness of stereotypes against indigenous peoples, and discriminatory policies. There's also a lack of empathy in our wider society. These are compounding elements or factors making MMIWR a difficult experience for many of our indigenous uh, families and relatives. As we talk about MMIWR, it is important to note that it is an issue that connects or intersects gender, indigeneity, white stream thinking, and heteronormativity. I am sure that your whole class will be uh, devoted in exploring these concepts. But uh, to begin our discussion on this, gender refers to an individual's personal or social identity as a man, a woman, or a non-binary person. So a non-binary person is a person who is not exclusively a man or a woman based on socially constructed ideas. Gender may also include the following concepts. Gender identity, which is uh, the gender that the person feels internally and individually. Gender expression, which is the way a person presents their gender regardless of their uh, sex and identity. Gender expression is true body language, aesthetic choices, um, and accessories, even clothes, hairstyle, and makeup, which may have traditionally been associated uh, with a specific gender. A person's gender may differ from their sex at birth and from what is indicated on their identification or legal documents, because a person's gender may change over time. It is important to look at MMIWR as an issue of gender, especially because uh, data now suggests that while originally thought that it is only women and girls who are victims of um, MM, uh, MMIWR, recent data suggests that trans, lesbians, gays, and two-spirit people are becoming are increasingly becoming victims of targeted violence. Indigeneity, on the other hand, is a complex term, but for the purpose of this sharing, we use it to mean membership to or self-identification with an indigenous group. In Canada, for instance, we have a diversity of indigenous peoples, but um, the most known would be the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. When we say MMWIR is an issue of white stream thinking. White stream refers to um, mainstream views, behaviors, and action with strong and outward bias towards white people. So white stream uh, could mean that we value um, white people more than non-white people or people of color such as uh, different studies suggesting that uh, while a huge or majority of the numbers of MMIWR uh, have indigenous peoples as victims, cases that have been uh, resolved or are paid attention to are usually the cases of uh, missing and murdered uh, white people. These points to the lack of equity and the way um, cases of uh, disappearances and murder are handled in uh, North America. Lastly, heteronormativity, which I have uh, mentioned earlier, uh, assumes that there are only two distinct opposite genders, which is male and female, and this is also called the gender binaries, and that for heteronormative uh, uh, principle, any gender identification and expression beyond these two are unacceptable and must not be privileged. I guess at this point, it is also important for us to talk a little about the term intersectionality. 
Intersectionality is the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of power, discrimination, and oppression, and we must consider everything and anything that can marginalize people. What can uh, contribute to our experience of privilege, discrimination, and oppression can be a result of our social location and identities. Social location and identities include our gender, our race, our age, our religion, and our class. Um, intersectionality also suggests that as living and breathing beings, our social locations and identities shape who we are. And these intersections create our encounters with social issues. So for instance, for MMIWR, uh, the cases of uh, murdered and uh, missing indigenous peoples and relative is a contribution of the power dynamics uh, around gender, around uh, race, and uh, around colonial history and culture of heteronormativity in North America. So MMWIR is an intersectional issue caused by the interplay of um, established thinking uh, around human rights as shaped by, as I mentioned, gender, race, colonial history, and uh, heteronormativity culture and thinking. Well, it has been more than a year since I encountered the hanging red dresses on campus. You might ask or wonder where am I now in terms of my understanding of this issue and why am I doing this sharing? There is still much to learn about the MMI um, WR and the past and ongoing relationship of Canada and the USA with the Aboriginal and Indigenous peoples. It has been a year or more than a year, but I am continuously reading, joining events, and searching resources in relation to this um, social concern. I am also actively trying to examine why we say every life matters, but not every life is valued the same. Another important um, thought that I keep in mind is as I try to understand more about uh, MMIWR, what can I actually do to contribute to changing this situation? Is it enough for me to feel empathy? But for sure, one of the biggest lessons I have gained so far in this learning journey is that while it is tempting to think of our indigenous uh, relatives as victims and unvalued members of our society, we must recognize their survivance. Survivance is a term that conjuncts resistance and survival. Survivance calls attention to the fact that not only have indigenous people survived centuries of violence and injustice, but they have also actively and continuously resist and fight systems of oppression. They continue to persist, they continue to heal, they continue to work for better societies. And that as non-Indigenous peoples, as Canadians, as settlers, or as guests here in North America, we can join and honor indigenous peoples in this active pursuit. As students, how can we do that? We can start by gaining better understanding of gendered and indigenous issues. We can examine our own privileges. We can start locating our possible contributions to the negative experiences of indigenous peoples. We can give little commitments and forge solidarity 
with different indigenous groups, with different uh, civil society organizations, with different initiatives around campus or around the city in relation to MMIWR um, or around indigenous rights. Here we see the difference between or amongst allies, accomplice, and co-resisters. But there's one thing for sure. Whether we want or are ready to commit in any of these three um, forms of uh, solidarity, any of this is a lifelong endeavor. And we can start small and start somewhere. To end, uh, I just want to emphasize that um, social justice work, just like having empathy, starts from within. No one can force you or pay you to, uh, to do so. Um, but one of the things that I would like to do uh, and as a way of maximizing my privilege of, of um, having this space is to share with you some resources that you might find valuable. Uh, I hope that you will have the time and energy and commitment to read in particular uh, two materials. The first is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada Calls to Action. And the second is the recent uh, report uh, on the national inquiry into MMIWR called Reclaiming Power in Place. I know that somewhere in my, uh, uh, in my um, talks in the slides, I have mentioned about allyship and uh, colonial history of Canada. And so I also leave you with some um, simple and digested uh, um, resource links uh, on allyship, on decolonization, and uh, uh, reconciliation. It has been my honor to uh, share this uh, information with you, and thank you uh, so much. If you uh, if you feel like having more conversations uh, about these topics, or if you have uh, further questions uh, or clarifications, in the next slide I will uh, leave you my name and contact details. Once again, thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing from you and to learning from your. Uh, experiences and reflections on this issue.